How does gene regulation help organisms respond to changing environmental conditions? This is gene expression in yeast. Your DNA contains thousands of genes to make thousands of different proteins that keep you alive and able to get through your day. But your body doesn't need to make all the proteins it can possibly make 100% of the time. That would waste way too much energy and matter. So genes that are not needed all the time can work on demand, only making the products they code for when those products are needed. This on-demand system is called gene regulation. And today, we'll explore how it works in yeast, which are tiny single-celled organisms. Yeast cells grow faster when plenty of food is available. Since yeast cells release carbon dioxide as they grow, you can look at how quickly carbon dioxide is released to estimate how quickly a yeast sample is growing. You can also tell if a yeast sample is able to consume a specific food you give it by seeing whether the sample releases more carbon dioxide compared to a different food source. Yeast might even be able to consume a type of food such as the sugars glucose or galactose, but only if enough of the sugar is present and only if there's enough time to activate the genes that make it possible to digest that specific sugar. Today, we're going to look for evidence of whether yeast genes to consume different sugars are either turned on or turned off. I have already connected my carbon dioxide sensor to my computer and chose a graph display. The procedure has two parts. Each of these bottles has 30 milliliters of liquid. These three bottles are for part one. The control has only distilled water. These two bottles have sugar solutions made with distilled water. This bottle has a 2% glucose solution, and this bottle has a 2% galactose solution. In part one, I'm going to add one half gram of yeast to each bottle and measure the change in carbon dioxide over five minutes. We can get an idea of whether the yeast can instantly consume either glucose or galactose by comparing the rate of carbon dioxide produced over time with the control run. Each of these bottles contain 30 milliliters, 2% galactose for part two, where we'll add liquid yeast samples that have been given 24 hours to try and grow in either plain distilled water or in a galactose solution. Like part one, we'll measure the change in carbon dioxide over five minutes when each yeast suspension is exposed to a galactose solution. When the yeast samples are added to the bottles and while data collection is going, you need to make sure the solution is constantly stirred. If you don't have a magnetic stirrer, you could slowly and steadily swirl the bottle across the tabletop to avoid splashing while keeping the bottle contents moving. I'm using a magnetic stirrer with a stir bar, so I'm using a clamp and rod to hold the bottle steady during data collection. Now we're all set to begin. Let's start with the control run. First, I want to start the stir at a medium speed that will avoid splashing since the sensor can't get wet. I'm adding 0.5 grams of active dry yeast to 30 milliliters of distilled water, sealing the bottle, and then starting data collection. I'm going to measure the change in carbon dioxide over five minutes and then I'll stop collecting data. We'll speed up data collection for you. And there's five minutes. If you were doing this experiment in the classroom, you might not be lucky enough to have as many sample bottles and bar magnets as I have, and you'd have to keep using the same bottle and magnet for the whole experiment. You'd need to rinse the bottle and magnet thoroughly after each run, first with tap water and then with distilled water, and then shake the bottle as dry as possible before adding 30 milliliters of 2% glucose to the bottle. Well, next I'm going to add 0.5 grams of yeast, to 30 milliliters of 2% glucose and collect data over five minutes.
We'll speed up data collection for you. And I've stopped collecting data. The next sugar solution is 2% galactose. I'm going to add 0.5 grams of yeast to the solution, and I'll collect data over five minutes. We'll speed up data collection for you. Before I move on to part two, I'm going to rename the runs. I'll see you in part two. Now in part two, we are using a 2% galactose solution in both bottles, but this time we're adding yeast that has been exposed to different environments over 24 hours. This solution was made with yeast and only distilled water, while this solution was made with yeast, distilled water, and galactose. Let's begin with the yeast that has been exposed only to distilled water. I'm going to stir the yeast suspension, then collect six milliliters, and add it to the bottle. We'll speed up data collection over the next five minutes. And five minutes is up. Now we'll look at the yeast that has been exposed to the galactose over 24 hours. Stirring the yeast suspension. I'm gonna collect six milliliters. and add it to the bottle. And we'll speed up data collection over five minutes. Now that all five runs are complete, you're ready to analyze the data. Make sure all runs are visible. Scale the graph. And sketch the graph with all five runs on your answer sheet. Add details and complete the graph as directed in the lab directions. You can show or hide runs in the legend by using the check mark. But anytime you want to use an analysis tool, make sure the run you want to analyze is selected. A selected run has a red box around its symbol. 
Any tools you use will apply only to the selected run. You will need to ignore the first minute of data collection in each run because during this first minute, the sensor is still adjusting to the new environment. So we'll work with only the last four minutes of data. Add a coordinate at 60 seconds. Grab the gray box and drag it until you see the dotted line line up with 60 seconds and then let go. Tap the coordinates tool to reveal options. Select the delta sign. Then move the new coordinate to the end of the run. Now you can see what the change in carbon dioxide is over the time between the two points. Make a note on the lab write-up that you're dividing delta y by delta x to determine the rate in units of parts per million per second. If your data was more linear, you could have used the slope of the linear fit tool instead to determine the rate. When making comparisons and answering questions on your answer sheet, look for significant differences among the rates, if any, to help you determine whether the yeast was able to digest the sugars or not in each run. If a sugar is being digested, then the genes that make that sugar digestible are turned on or are actively being expressed. If a sugar is not being digested, the genes that make it digestible are turned off or are repressed. You might notice a background level of yeast metabolism even in the control run because before yeast is packaged, it is put into a dormant state and it may be coated with starch or other dead yeast cells or other carbon sources which the yeast may be able to digest as soon as you expose it to room temperature water. Take the background metabolism rate into consideration when you are making comparisons. You now have all the information you need to complete the analysis and answer questions in the lab write-up. Good luck.